When Texians went to the polls on September 6, 1841, they had not yet learned of the Santa Fe fiasco. Yet, even without that doleful intelligence, most had already lost patience with Lamar's extravagant schemes. A blind hog could discern that the nation was bankrupt. Texas paper money, styled redbacks, became more and more depressed. A Roman Catholic priest trying to start a church in Texas described the national mood. Writing from Houston City in July 1841, he commented, I arrived last night at this place and found the people in pretty low spirits. Everything looks dull. No money in the country. People move back to the United States pretty much faster than they came in. I am really out of heart. In the States, a log church may be at least put up, but here in Texas, there is nothing to be done without money, and money can be had nowhere. The slate of candidates surprised no one. Lamar's vice president and former interim president, David G. Burnett, represented the anti-Houston faction. Sam Houston's supporters urged their man to run, claiming that only he had the experience and ability to untangle the jumble Lamar had left. In the end, he did not require that much prompting. Nowadays, Texans recall Lamar with disdain. Truthfully, there was much to censure. Still, his administration was not without its successes. President Lamar pushed through a bill that ensured the future of public education. He famously declared, The cultivated mind is the guardian genius of democracy, and while guided by and controlled by virtue, the noblest attribute of man. It is the only dictator that free man acknowledge and the only security that free man desire. To this day, Texans honor Lamar, not Houston, as the father of Texas education. The poet president also fostered the Homestead Act, which prevented citizens from losing their homes to debt. In 1839, he established the city of Austin and moved the capital there. That same year, he approved the Lone Star flag as the national standard, the one that even now flies as the state flag. Lamar was in the tradition of Texas wildcatters, men possessed with and by great dreams, those who either won or lost in spectacular fashion. One may decry their failures, but admire their vision. Indeed, vision and personality were the central issues of the 1841 presidential campaign. Where would the next president take the country? How would he address the republic's multiple difficulties. As Lamar's vice president, Burnett found it impossible to separate himself from that administration's failed policies. His only argument was that Houston would be worse. Diligent and well-meaning, Burnett, a New Jersey Yankee, was also cold and contentious. A devout Presbyterian, Burnett neither drank nor swore. In addition, he carried the Holy Bible with him everywhere he went. Dr. Ashbel Smith described him as a character that old John Knox would have hugged with grim delight. He was uncomfortable on the stump where he came across as distant and spiteful. Houston, of course, was in his natural element. Standing six feet three inches and weighing in at 240 pounds, 
Houston looked like every schoolboy's idea of a hero. Some charitably minded individuals might have described Burnett as portly, but most would have called him fat. On the stump, Houston was quick with a joke or an anecdote, and while never shying away from invective, he always delivered it with a gleam in his eye. Unlike his opponent, Houston was notorious for both his imbibing and his profanity. Early on, the campaign turned ugly, worse than Texians ever witnessed. The pious Burnett made Houston's intemperance his central theme. That old Sam Jacinta was an alcoholic was an open secret. His benders were the stuff of legend. One of Houston's friends warned him that his health and reputation would soon sink under the influence of liquor, and prayed, May an all-wise providence chain you down to sobriety and prudence. Burnett supporters contrasted the two candidates. The, the private character of the individual elected should be free from blemish or any degrading vice. Burnett has been tried in adversity and prosperity, and never found capable and faithful to the best interests of the people. Why then should we hesitate? By electing a drunkard, we cast the high destinies of our beloved republic upon a die and leave it to blind chance. The Texas Sentinel a pro-Burnett newspaper, warned that Houston would blaspheme his God by the most horrible oaths that ever fell from the lip of man. Writing under the pen name Truth, Houston fired back in the pages of the Houstonian. Addressing Burnett directly, he blasted. You prate about the faults of other men while the blot of foul, unmitigated treason rests upon you. You political brawler and canting hypocrite, who the water of Jordan could never cleanse from your political and moral leprosy. Discovering Houston's old Cherokee epithet, Burnett began to call his rival Big Drunk. He even accused Houston of being part Indian. It wasn't true, but Houston, proud of his adopted Cherokee family, turned the tables and wryly thanked Burnett for the compliment. Indeed, emphasizing his native background, Houston rebuked Burnett as a Watumka, the word translated as hog thief. The towering Houston further dubbed his diminutive challenger Little Davy. And so it went, each day generating another outlandish defamation. As a younger man, Houston had mastered the bare-knuckled maneuvers of Jacksonian politics. But even he grew disgusted with all the vituperation, admitting I am constrained to believe that the people of Texas are thoroughly disgusted with both of us. Political operatives projected a Houston landslide. Even on the western frontier, where support for Burnett should have been strongest, forecasts were grim. Writing from Austin, San Jacinto veteran Henry Millard recorded, Burnett is completely done. He could not now in the western counties be elected Fiddler General to the old chief. Predictions proved accurate. Houston carried the election with 7,915 votes. Burnett lagged far behind with 3,616. In the race for vice president, Edward Burleson, a Houston man, 
received 6,141 votes. Mimic and Hunt, representing the Burnett camp, collected 4,336. Yes, the sword of San Jacinto was a functioning alcoholic, but the operative word was functioning. The priggish Burnett tried to make Houston's drinking an issue, but it never seemed to register with voters. On election day, Texians excused his vices with a wink and a nod. Ultimately, who among his opponents had accomplished half as much sober as Houston drunk? Explaining the outcome of the election of 1841 to a friend, Texas merchant James Morgan captured the public's disposition. Old Sam H., with all his faults, appears to be the only man for Texas. He is still unsteady, intemperate, but drunk in a ditch, he's worth a thousand of Lamar and Burnett. 